Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, tomorrow we in the United States are celebrating Labor Day. Any of you heard of that? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've heard a lot. There's Labor Day sales going on, Labor Day barbecues, Labor Day traffic with warnings of not drinking and driving, I-70 being packed with campers and weekend warriors returning to the city. Many outdoor pools will see their last day of the season. I find this very sad. Growing up, I learned that Labor Day was the last day to wear summer whites, so I'm wearing my white skirt today. The Colorado State Fair is finishing up its 150th year tomorrow. We, when we lived there, we frequent during this time. And Labor Day is the unofficial change of the season for us, from summer to fall, even though it's not yet the equinox. Well, these things I just mentioned are an important part of the culture of the holiday. The holiday itself is an important part of American history. The debates, and let's get real, the arguments that Americans have over employment, workers' rights, safety, minimum wage, hours, holidays, benefits, living conditions, equity, have gone on for a long, long time. We might be more aware now, or at least we think we are, of the arguments today because we are bombarded with talk radio 24-7 and endless sources of opinions being expressed on and off the media. Labor Day, an annual celebration for and of workers and their achievements originated during one of America's labor, American labor's history's most dismal chapters. In the late 1800s, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, the average American worked 12-hour days and seven-day weeks in order to eke out a basic living. Despite restrictions in some states, children as young as five or six worked in mills factories and mines across the country, earning a fraction of their adult counterparts' wages. People of all ages, particularly the poor, the very poor, and the recent immigrants, often faced extremely unsafe working conditions with insufficient access to air, fresh air, sanitary conditions, and breaks. As manufacturing increasingly supplanted agriculture as the wellspring of American employment, labor unions, which had first appeared in the late 18th century, grew more prominent and more vocal. They began organizing strikes and rallies to protest poor conditions and compel employers to renegotiate hours and pay. Some of these, many of these, turned violent. Y'all can look up the history of Labor Day if you're interested in learning more about the harsh and the tragic details. But in the wake of the massive unrest and in an attempt to repair ties with American workers, Congress passed an act making Labor Day a legal holiday in the District of Columbia and in the territories. In 1894, President Grover Cleveland signed it into law. I share this today so that we can recognize one, one another as workers, but also that we remember our past or learn about our past and not have to repeat the hard lessons that have already been learned. We who follow Christ continually pray, teach, and challenge ourselves to reach out to the marginalized as Jesus taught and acted upon in the Gospels. Regardless of what the popular rhetoric is, we know in our hearts that we are to be the defender and the supporter of those who are not being treated fairly, legally or compassionately. It's also a day to take some time and contemplate the holiness of work I want you to think about that, about what you do, 
And consider that the work you do now, whatever it is, is a holy calling from God. Have you considered that? Too often we think that pastors and missionaries and deacons and church workers alone do the holy. And that just isn't true. Too many folks view work chiefly as a burden. Granted, some days it is. I get that. Through the years, I've heard beliefs expressed that what people do during the day and throughout the week to earn an income and manage a household is not nearly as important as, say, when they taught Sunday school, worked with a youth group, went on a mission trip, served in an outreach program. What you do in your daily life is as important a calling as when you participate in the life of the church. Did you hear that? Do you understand it? What you do daily in your living is your God-given calling. For the last two weeks in confirmation class, the youth and I have been watching a video on Martin Luther. It's an interesting movie, and it's based on the writings by Luther, as well as the biographies of Luther. And I've decided I'm including the link in this week's voice so that all of you can watch it when you want to. It's, it is very interesting, and it, it's a good movie. The medieval church, however, we learned, separated the sacred from the secular. There was a sharp distinction with the belief that the real spiritual work took place in the church and in the, inside the monasteries. By implication, the church taught that certain callings in life were inherently more holy than others. The priest, for example, was considered to be in a better position to secure his place in heaven than, say, the cobbler, the one who makes shoes. The thought was that the priest served God while the cobbler served himself. It was also thought that the monk was closer to God than the farmer, say, because a deep relationship with Christ was achieved through solitary meditation and prayer, and not the lowly work of toiling and tilling the soil. Even the word vocation prior to the Reformation referred specifically to church-related callings, like serving as a priest or a monk or a nun. Martin Luther recaptured this word and used it to refer to every other calling a Christian might legitimately fulfill. Cobbler, farmer, baker, blacksmith, wife, mother, civil servant, and so on. But his emphasis here was not the arbitrary decision of a disgruntled ex-monk to undermine the church's teachings. No. To Luther, the cobbler's work was just as valuable as a priest precisely because of the theology. Precisely because justification is received by faith alone, not by works. A sinner did not become a Christian or earn his right standing with God on the basis of mystical contemplation or religious activity. Luther understood from Scripture, and he upturned the world with his teaching, that salvation and righteousness is a gift from God through faith, and again, not something we earn or can claim through any work of our own. And I hope that you understand or are reminded that anything we do as a job can be seen as a calling from God. Anything. Colossians 3.23 reads, Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than the people. Let me read that again. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Well, I've had an eclectic work history. I started out as a babysitter and, 
answering the phone at my father's construction company. I've been a youth director, a t-shirt maker, letter carrier, service desk manager, background screener. I ran reports for a credit reporting agency. I've been a volunteer coordinator and operations manager for Habitat for Humanity in West Hawaii. I'm sure I could add a few more things to that list. And in all of them, all of them, God has put people in my path who I wouldn't have met otherwise. People who had spiritual questions, shared concerns, asked for prayers. I've listened, met, spoke with, and prayed for people who might not otherwise ever enter a church or seek out a pastor. And I felt like in addition to the work that I was hired to do, I was also called to be available to those who might need a listening ear or a compassionate response. Wherever you are this week, there may be someone that God puts in your path who needs and wants to experience the holy but won't seek it out beyond what you might offer. And understand that the work you do, from being a student to taking care of a home to a career through to retirement, all work is a gift from and to God. When I was a teenager, I made the decision to go into full-time Christian work. That's how it was phrased. Full-time Christian work. Unsure of what that looked like, but feeling that God was calling me to such. Well, one day I joined in a conference with others who also felt called to full-time Christian work. And I recall someone expressing, uh, one of the older teenagers expressing, that just because they weren't going to work in the church didn't mean that they loved God less or what they wanted to do was less worthy and living their life. They already had goals to be a teacher and wasn't that as worthy. And the adult in the room said, exactly, exactly. While we are proud of the youth who have made this decision, who have answered this call to ministry, everyone, everyone has a calling to live in God's will and to be true to their vocation and their calling. There's a meme out that's with a quote attributed to, to Luther, probably falsely, but it goes like this. The Christian shoemaker does his Christian duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes, because God is interested in good craftsmanship. So, like I said, while there's doubt that Luther actually said this, but what marks Luther's doctrine of vocation is his insistence that all work be done in service of neighbor and in service of the world. God likes shoes and good ones, not for their own sake, but because the neighbor needs shoes. When I'm preparing for a funeral, I enjoy hearing the stories from the family and the friends, the loved ones, and I read the obituary about the person. And I often wish that I'd gotten to know that person better, that I'd gotten to hear the stories from them. I imagine they had great stories to tell about their life, whether they realized it or not, but about their work, what they liked to do, what they were called to do, what they enjoyed doing, where they visited, who was important to them, and where they experienced the holy. And who doesn't like a good story? We, too, have a good story to tell about our faith. We have a heavenly parent who loves us so much that they created the world, populated it with people, plants, animals, water, and provided the sun, moon, and stars. Then there's the story of the Holy One who came to earth to try and get our attention, to teach us and show us how much we are loved and how we are to love others. And then there's the continuation of the story of the Spirit who continues to surround us with grace and mercy, guiding us, exhorting us, comforting us, sharpening us, 
to live our lives as God has blessed us to live and to work with the God-given talents, with the God-given gifts, with the education and the experiences that we have. On this Labor Day weekend, we give thanks to God for directing our steps and our labor. And may we honor one another in the work and labor that each one does. And for that we say, thanks be to God. Amen.